Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode in our webinar series and the final one for 2023. Today's topic is going to be DARVO and gender-based violence. But to start, just the usual warning that some of the content you might hear could be upsetting for some folks, so please practice good self-care and step away or pause the playback if you need to. And also, we'd like to acknowledge that the Women's Resource Centre is located on Treaty 2 territory, and we also operate on Treaty 1 territory, which are the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and is also the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. So let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to go over what is DARVO, and that might be a concept that's or an acronym that some people are unfamiliar with. We're going to talk about what it is, and then we're going to talk about what it looks like. We're going to talk about how it affects people's perceptions of victim and offender, um, specifically how it affects self-blame and how it impacts um, sexual assault. Then we're going to go over our list of resources for today. And finally, of course, our contact information will be at the end for you, as always. So what is DARVO? Um, while you might not be familiar with the acronym, a lot of the things that I'm going to describe for you over the course of this webinar are probably going to sound very familiar. Um, DARVO is just a way to attach a name to it so that it's easy to or easier to refer to it and have a name to go with what the experiences a lot of people have are. So DARVO is an acronym that represents a manipulation tactic that's used by abusers, which stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And we're going to go over that in greater detail, so don't worry if it doesn't stick for you right now. By the end of the webinar, I promise I will. So it's a way for perpetrators of abuse to manipulate those around them after abuse has occurred. Um, and it's really a way for abusers to attempt to minimize the harm that they've caused, to redirect attention from them and onto the victim of survivors, victims or survivors of the abuse, and to try and mitigate any potential consequences they might be facing as a result of um, perpetrating that abuse. So what does it look like? As with anything that we talk about related to gender-based violence, it's going to look different based on the scenario, the situation. But um, when we talk about DARVO and gender-based violence, there are some common themes that we typically see. Um, so I'll highlight those for you. But again, it's going to be dependent on the situation, what kinds of things people experience. So under the deny category, an abuser will typically strongly deny that the abuse happened um, at all. Never mind that they didn't perpetrate it, that the, it didn't even happen. They might gaslight the victim or survivor to make them question their own knowledge of events and make them doubt themselves, make them question reality. And this is to try and minimize, the again, the abuse that they've perpetrated to make the victim or survivor either believe that it didn't happen or that it wasn't a big deal. And the abuser can use this as well when dealing with police or the justice system. They'll deny that the abuse happened, they'll minimize it to the police, they'll try and make the police believe that it wasn't a big deal. And again, that is in an effort to kind of mitigate any potential consequences that they might face for perpetrating this abuse. The A, attack. Um, in this situation, the abuser typically tries to undermine the victim or survivor's credibility, um, try to make out that they're not believable, that they shouldn't be believed, try and give reasons why they shouldn't be believed. Um, so to, to do this, there's a lot of ways that somebody might do this, but for example, they might use completely unrelated events, they might lie and make things up, they might try to weaponize the victim or survivor's mental health challenges or invent mental health challenges that the victim or survivor might have, they might bring up substance use, and all of this is a way to try and make the victim or survivor's credibility less and this is a common tactic that we see in gender-based violence cases that make it to court. So whether that's domestic violence or intimate partner violence or sexual assault, um, this second part of the DARVO triad um, tries to show the public or members of the justice system why this victim or survivor shouldn't be believed and why they're not credible. And the third part of DARVO is the reverse victim and offender. And when this part happens, the abuser will try to position themselves as the victim. Um, they might even assert that it's the victim or survivor who's perpetrating the abuse. They 
do this to shift the focus onto the victim or survivor to gain undeserved sympathy. They try to manipulate the people around them, whether that's members of the public or friends or family or members of the justice system. And then also to try and mitigate any consequences they could be facing, because if they make out like they're the victim in this situation, then there's a higher likelihood that they'll face lesser consequences. Sometimes um, abusers will do this by highlighting any good things that they've ever done in their life and kind of making it out like they're kind of a hero um, in every other aspect. So really this one situation isn't that bad compared to the other potential good things that they might have done. Um, So they try to minimize the abuse that way. Um, But when they do this, they cause, of course, another layer of trauma to the victim or survivor. Um, especially when we get into the court setting and there are other people brought into the situation. Um, The court process is already very traumatizing for a lot of folks who have experienced gender-based violence. There are already a lot of barriers to accessing justice through the justice system. Um, And when a perpetrator uses DARVO, um, they're causing another layer to that trauma. They're also potentially damaging the reputation of the victim or survivor by lying, by manipulating, um, by twisting events and words, um, and causing that shift in focus that prevents the survivor from getting help. So not only is it damaging psychologically, it could also be damaging physically because when the perpetrator is using DARVO to shift the focus, Um, they're actually preventing somebody from getting the help that they need and getting the justice they deserve. So DARVO might result in the perpetrator receiving lighter or perhaps no consequences for their behavior. And we're going to talk about that um, shortly. So as you might have gathered from what we've talked about so far, um, DARVO has a great ability to impact how victims of gender-based violence, victims and survivors of gender-based violence are viewed, and how the perpetrator or offender themselves is viewed. That is the intent of DARVO, is to change how people perceive the victim or survivor and how the offender is perceived. And there have been, there is not a lot of um, literature on DARVO as of yet. I, In preparing for this webinar, I've read pretty much all there is currently um, in the academic um, field for DARVO. Um, But there have been a couple of studies that have been done on DARVO that have assessed how the use of this technique affects public perception of victims and survivors, as well as of the perpetrator. And this was done through um, providing the participants in the studies with simulated situations of gender-based violence and abuse. In some of the situations that people received, there was DARVO present in the description of the scenario. And in other descriptions of the same scenario, there was no DARVO. And the purpose was to see how the people reacted to different questions based on whether or not they had had read the scenario that had included DARVO. Um, And the studies also um, asked people who have experienced gender-based violence um, about their exposure to DARVO after that abuse had happened and what that was like, um, what kind of tactics were used and how that DARVO affected the outcome of the justice system cases, um, how it affected um, the way that the people around them perceived them, the victim survivor, as well as the offender of the gender-based violence. So we're gonna go over those findings here just to illustrate kind of how DARVO works in practice and the effects, the very, very real effects that this tactic can have on um, victims and survivors and their ability to access justice. So it was found that experiencing DARVO as a component of gender-based violence um, brings up feelings of confusion for victims or survivors and can actually prevent them from coming forward about their experiences. So say somebody um, experienced gender-based violence, say domestic violence, for example, um, and the perpetrator of that abuse employs DARVO technique. And a lot of times, I would say most of the time, perpetrators don't 
actively say in their head, I'm going to use Darvo on this victim or survivor. Um, but it's such a common, becomes such a common way for perpetrators to manipulate the people around them and to mitigate the um, consequences that they may face and to minimize the abuse that they've perpetrated, that it's become under this heading of Darvo. It's so common that, and so many abusers use it, that um, it's been given this name. So I just wanted to clear that up. But So it's been found that when um, victims or survivors experience Darvo as a component of gender-based violence, it can actually prevent them from coming forward about their experiences. So again, say we're talking about a situation of domestic violence and the abuser in the scenario has denied that the abuse has happened. They've gaslit the um, victim or survivor to make them question um, their perception of events, to make them question whether it even happened, um, have made themselves out to be the victim, um, have attacked the victim or survivor's credibility. That can be extremely confusing for a victim or survivor, and they may actually start to doubt um their experiences and they might end up not coming forward at all or coming forward after a length of time so it has a really significant effect on um victims and survivors of gender-based violence and in one study of darbo experiences in case of gender-based violence 72 percent of the participants who were victims or survivors of gbb reported experiencing all three aspects of Darbo post-GBV incident. So they experienced the denial, they experienced the attacks, and they experienced the reverse victim of offender. That is a very, very large number. Um, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying previously about how perpetrators don't consciously say necessarily, I'm going to use Darbo as a tactic, but so many perpetrators use these same ways of minimizing the abuse and avoiding consequences that it has been given this name Darvo because it is so common. As you can see, 72%. In the same study as the one I just mentioned, 51% of participants, again, the participants in this case were victims and survivors of GBV, 51% of participants experienced at least one element of Darvo. So they experienced um, one out, at least one out of the three, 72%, as I mentioned prior, experienced all three. So again, that's a really high number. Um, and it just goes to show how common Darvo as a tactic is that perpetrators use. It's also been found in these studies that the more Darvo victims or survivors experienced post-incident, the more they experienced this tactic, the more they experienced feelings of self-blame and confusion or doubt. And these were found to be the most common feelings experienced by victims or survivors who had also experienced Starvo is that um, self-blame and confusion or doubt. Um, when perpetrators offered an apology to the victims or survivors, uh, even an insincere one that incorporated one or more elements of Darvo, as that is Something that is seen in court cases sometimes is um, perpetrators will, will offer an apology um, in an attempt to lighten the consequences by showing remorse for their actions. Um, when perpetrators offered an apology and even an insincere one that incorporated elements of Darvo, Darvo, this was found to be associated with less severe punishment and increased sympathy for the perpetrator. So Darvo can even be incorporated into apologies for gender-based violence, and that has been shown to have an effect on the amount of punishment the perpetrator receives and how they are viewed by uh, members of the justice system, by the public, by friends and family. One study actually asked members of the public to read fictitious situations of abuse. Again, this is what I was referring to before, some containing Darvo, some not. And it was found that the members of the public who read the scenarios where Darvo is present tended to perceive the victim or survivor as less believable and more abusive. So that goes to show that um, Darvo Im impacts how the credibility of the victim survivor is perceived and the reverse victim offender part of Darvo um, is also influential on how members of the public perceive victims or survivors of gender-based violence. 
in the same study as the one that I was just talking about a second ago, uh, members of the public who read scenarios where Darbo was present found that the perpetrator was more believable when they were saying that they were didn't do it or it didn't happen, and that they were less abusive and less responsible for the abuse. So again, this goes to show how effective the denial and attacks are and how effective the act of trying to reverse victim and offender is um, when perpetrators of gender-based violence employ this Darbo technique. It has a great impact on the ways that the members of the public and family and friends view the victim and survivor and view the offender. Um, those participants of this same study who were exposed to statements with Darbo were also more in favor of punishing the victim or survivor and less in favor of punishing the perpetrator. So that is really alarming, a really alarming finding, um, because not only does it affect the perceptions of the victim and survivor and offender, but it also impacts the punishment that the perpetrator gets, in fact, if they get punishment at all, um, and actually can work towards punishing the victim or survivor for the abuse that they experienced, which is, of course, not at all um, what we want. Darvo also shows up in defamation lawsuits, it's been found, and then provides another avenue for perpetrators of GBV to use this Darvo tactic outside of criminal proceedings. So typically, we see Darvo used in criminal proceedings um, where violence is take, gender-based violence has taken place, um, but perpetrators have also been shown to use Darbo tactics in defamation lawsuits where they're suing the victim or survivor for libel um, and basically um, asserting that you know they're lying, that the perpetrator is the actual victim. Um, so you can see how those kind of those two things kind of fit together. Specifically in cases of sexual violence, well over 60% of perpetrators engaged in the denial aspect of Darvo. 84% said that they only did what they did because of their level of intoxication. And this is one way of minimizing the violence that was perpetrated and trying to de-emphasize the perpetrator's own responsibility for their actions. 78% of perpetrators claimed that the victim or survivor was in some way to blame for the violence because of their quote-unquote lifestyle. So they often brought up things like sex work or substance use or having children out of wedlock as a reason that the victim or survivor would be in some way culpable or to blame for the abuse that they experienced, which is, of course, ludicrous. But as we've seen, um, these types of assertions have a real impact on how perpetrators are viewed um, when they've um, engaged in gender-based violence. Uh, in cases of domestic violence or intimate partner violence specifically, 21.5% of perpetrators denied that the violence even happened. 82.6% of male perpetrators of domestic violence used at least one type of minimization. And this, again, is in an effort to limit their perceived responsibility for the abuse that occurred. And over half of perpetrators, male perpetrators, blame the victim or survivor for the violence that happened in at least one way. Um, women victim or survivors of gender-based violence tend to hear Darbo more often than male victims or survivors of gender-based violence. And um, women who experience gender-based violence typically experience higher levels of the denial and de-emphasis aspect of Darbo. They experienced more attacks and victim blaming, and they also experienced greater victim and offender reversals. So we can see how this is a gendered phenomenon that appears that um, not only are more male perpetrators engaging in Darbo, but more female victims and survivors of gender-based violence are experiencing Darbo post-incident. One study shows that male members of the public are more likely to rate victims or survivors as less believable, more abusive, and overall more responsible for the abuse than would female members of the public who are um, observing the same scenario. So again, it goes to show how, not only how um, impactful Darbo can be as a tactic for influencing members of the public, members of the justice system and friends and family, but also how Darbo is a gendered phenomenon. And again, in more ways than one, as we've seen through this slide. The use of Darbo 
significantly affects how the public views victims versus offenders of gender-based violence, as we've seen. Um, it's greatly influential on the way that victims and survivors view themselves. It has the potential to impact whether they come forward about gender-based violence that they've experienced, which is something that's already an issue in cases of gender-based violence, as those types of crimes are among the most underreported. And it has the um, ability to cause great psychological and emotional distress to victims and survivors. They can um, experience significant feelings of confusion and self-doubt and um, guilt, um, all based on this tactic of Darwo being perpetrated. And given how much credence is lent to the credibility or perceptions of victims or survivors in courts, this is something we hear a lot um, about um, victims or survivors of gender-based violence, whether it's sexual assault or domestic violence, their credibility is talked about a lot in court proceedings. Um, so it's really important that we know how DARBO plays into this. Um, for the simple reason that is summed up right here at the bottom, I couldn't have put it better myself, so I thought we'll just put the quote right in there, and it says, simply having an awareness of DARVO and its use by perpetrators may serve to mitigate some of the negative side effects associated with DARVO, particularly the increased sense of self-blame in victims. So, as we always say, information is power, and understanding this tactic um, allows people to give a name to a lot of the things that they've experienced. Because like I mentioned before several times, perpetrators don't consciously think, oh, I'm, I'm going to use Darvo um, today. Um, they use, it is very common that these tactics of denying and attacking and reversing victim and offender are used, and they're so commonly used that it's been given this name. Um, and it's really a way for people to understand and recognize um, these signs of manipulation and minimization that can be really harmful for victims and survivors and can, again, significantly affect how the public and the justice system and friends and family view the victims versus offenders of gender-based violence. So all of these resources were utilized in one way or another during this presentation. Um, a lot of the articles, all of these articles here are where the information from the studies was found. So if you'd like to read more about those studies, um, they're all listed for you here. The two websites at the top have um, blog posts from gender-based, anti-gender-based violence practitioners on DARVO. Um, they have some useful explainers on there that might be useful for some people. So I've included them as well. And again, all of the resources listed here will be in the description of the video below and the links will be clickable. So just head there if you'd like to have a look at the resources. And finally, our contact information, of course, if at any time you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and yeah, that's it for our final webinar of 2023, and we will see everybody in the new year.